Hey guys, welcome to Big Church Online. We are so excited that you've joined us today. If you're looking for any sermons or words of encouragement, you've come to the right place. While you're here, please subscribe, like, comment, share. That way you can stay up to date and help others find it as well. Now, let's get this week's sermon in progress. Oh, as we continue our series, if this is your first Sunday with us, we're, do, we're into a series called, anybody remember Paul Harvey? The rest of the story. We're in a series right now where we're kind of recapping everything that happened after uh, the Jesus' uh, death and resurrection. But as we continue, we remember that Jesus was crucified. He was put in a tomb and then he was resurrected. You know, he didn't stay in that tomb. That because he lives, we can face tomorrow. I almost feel like singing that one. But, but because he lives, we can face tomorrow. But last week we learned that Jesus, after everything else, he showed up for Mary. He showed up for the woman at the tomb. He showed up for the disciples in a physical form. And listen, we can always be assured that whatever we're going through, no matter what situation, no matter what heartbreak, no matter how, what high or low God, Jesus is always going to show up for us when we need him. We also remember that he offered redemption and restoration Listen, Peter had royally messed up. Anybody royally messed up in here? Oh man, look at all y'all. Y'all are saved bunch of in here. <laughs> Peter had royally messed up. He not only denied Jesus once, but he did it twice. And then he did it three times. So he was feeling a certain way. And what he did, he turned around and went back to what was familiar. He went back to his fishing. He went back to what he felt like it was before he met Jesus. But Jesus still... He said to him, go tell the disciples and Peter. He knew that Peter needed a little more encouragement because of all the messing up that he had done. And I love that he called Peter by name. As I said last week, he knows your name. Your DNA, you know, there's no one else like you in the world right now. Your fingerprint is different. Your, if you, your hair has got this different DNA if you still have any. But he knows you. He calls you by your name title of this message is basically the rest of the story. And as this story continues, we see Jesus. He's about to leave. He's speaking to his disciples and he's saying, listen, I'm leaving, but I'm going to leave peace with you. I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here physically, but I'm leaving the peace that the world cannot give you, that the world cannot comprehend. I'm leaving that with you. And here's the good thing. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And that where I am, you can be also. So he's like, I'm not only leaving you, but I'm, going, I'm about to go make you a great pad up in heaven. And one day I'm coming back and you're going with me. But he's, he was also telling them, we've still got some work to do while we're here. Jesus was turning over the responsibility of continuing the, miss, the mission that he had started. Let's look at Matthew 28, 19. It says this. It says, go, therefore... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Here's the thing. They had to become disciples to make disciples. He said, follow me. Come on. We have a hard time getting to church consistently. And he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. What did follow me mean? It means they dropped their nets. They dropped their occupations. They dropped their families. They dropped everything around them to follow him. What kind of dedication is that? But they had to do that to become the disciples they needed to be to make disciples. Can I just tell you, God is no respecter of people in here. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter uh, where your background's from. He, does, he is not a respecter of people. And I wrote here, God can use anybody. He used a loudmouth fisherman. Come on, anybody relate to Peter? He's always saying stuff he shouldn't say. And like I said, that look I got when I got up here, she's like, what is he about to say? You never know. But he took a bunch of common loudmouth tax collectors that nobody wanted to be around. He took a thief under his wing. He took a doubter. He took a bunch of unknowns and said, I'm going to use you to turn the world upside down. God wants to you. You might be saying me. Yes. It doesn't matter what you've been. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how long you've been there. God can still use you. But let me ask you this question. 
How much are you willing to invest to see God transform your life and their lives around us? That's the question we have to ask because so many times we want the promotion without the preparation. So many times we want a platform before we ever plow any kind of field. Ooh. We want the status, but we don't want the seeking. The Bible says you have been faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Servants, people have that kind of mentality, are the ones that God uses to be rulers and leaders in the world today. Servants who are teachable, humble, adaptable, and the one, are the ones that God can use. God wants to use us in this room to bring people to him, but here's what he's looking for. You gotta be willing, and you gotta be available. God will take availability over talent any day. Come on, we got some people that are really talented, but they don't want to do nothing. But you, got some, but you got some people in here that may not have the talent. They may not have all of the tools, but they say, available, God, use me. Send me where you want me to go. I'll do what you tell me to do. God is looking for that over talent. He can do a lot with people who are willing and available. And here's another thing. We can't be judgmental. Jesus was the hardest on the, on the religious folk, wasn't he? Hey, Pharisees, quit looking down your nose at everyone else. So many times, oh, come on, help me, Jesus. So many times we come to Christ and then we see people that are struggling and going through and we look down our nose at them and we start saying, well, look at them. I can't believe they did. You forget where you've been. Listen, next time you feel like looking down on somebody, you need to go back about 10 years. You need to go back about 20 years and see the pit that God pulled you out of. Turns your judgment off just that fast. Here's what we also have to do. We have to form relationships. Relationships are the key to growing. Not only that, our families being saved, but also seeing the church grow. Jesus modeled it. Here's what I loved about Jesus. He didn't just talk about it. She loves it. Don't just talk about it. Be about it. That's her quote to me all the time. But he, he didn't just talk about it. He was about it. He showed it to us. He modeled it. Jesus was our example. Listen, here's the good thing. He wasn't concerned about the condition they were in. He didn't care what they looked like. Everyone was screaming at the lepers and saying, unclean, unclean, don't go around them. They were banished. Nobody could be around them. But Jesus stepped into their message, their mess, and he cleaned them up. It's what he does. He didn't care what they looked like. Everyone said, you can't be around them. You can't touch them. He says, I'm about to show you what I can do. Bam! He didn't care where they had been. They brought a woman to him and said, hey, She'd been sleeping with this dude, and I don't know where the guy was at. Anyway, all they did was bring, that'll preach for another Sunday. But they bring this woman to him and said, hey, she got caught in, a, in, caught in the very act. She's guilty. And Jesus started talking to them, and he said, hey, if, you know, I loved how Jesus did. He started writing in the sand. He didn't even say nothing. He's like, here he started writing. All of a sudden, half them dudes start taking off. No matter, there's probably what he wrote was liar, cheat, uh, a, a gossip, adulterer. And before too long, he looked around at the woman with forgiveness and compassion and said, where are the people who are, because that's what he modeled, where are those people at that were, he, she said, they're not here no more. He said, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. He met her in the middle of her mess. <sighs> he didn't really care what they acted like. He still pursued Peter. How many of us would give up on Peter after the first time? Come on. You might have been betrayed in your life. You, you might have given up on Peter the first time. It's definitely the second time. I ain't have nothing to do with Peter. Peter, bloop, bye, Peter. That third time, you definitely, I've done wrote him off. He, he can't do anything else. But Jesus met Peter where he was at. Oh. Jesus knew that relationship with him was the only way that we could ever be reconciled to God. Can I just tell you, I don't care what the world is telling you, Jesus is the only way for salvation. You can't get it anywhere else. Jesus is the way. 
Now what he was doing, he was instructing his disciples. He's instructing us to carry out the mission. There was still work to do. But Jesus knew they couldn't do it on their own. Right. He knew that in their own power, they would never do it and they were going to need help. Now he was leaving and they were still a little bit untrained, a little bit unsured. But look at John 16, 7. It says this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus knew in his humanity. You don't know, realize Jesus was human when he came down. He felt what you felt. Yep, people, people lose sight of that. He was cold. He was hungry. He was tired. He was unwilling sometimes. Ah, God, I don't really want to do that, but I'm going to do it because you asked me to, God. He couldn't reach everyone because of his humanity. And Jesus became flesh. He was tempted. And he was relatable to us. He reached the thousands, but he knew the future. He knew there was a world out there that he needed to reach that he couldn't do it in his own physical step, his own physicality. That's not even the right word. They needed to be empowered and they needed to be instructed on how to do it. How many of y'all like following the instructions? I'm married. And I do very not so great at following the instructions, the instructions sometimes. But when you go to build something, I got a table back she so graciously stole my table out of there, the one I really liked. But she found me another table. It's still sitting back there in the box. Anybody want to put a table together this week? Because I ain't. Because all of the instructions, whether they're in English, they all look like they're in Chinese to me. Anybody out there feel that same way? A to C to B to whatever. And then you put that thing and it's all... No, don't you shake your head at me, Gary. You don't want me to put stuff together. And then sometimes we tried to put it together. It took us two hours to put it together. We had it on backwards and we were mad at each other. <laughs> y'all know, y'all, I, I see these over here. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But Jesus is telling his disciples, listen to the instructions. In Acts 1, he says this, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to, to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Wait a minute, Jesus. We're supposed to stay in Jerusalem. That's crazy. You know why that's crazy? Did you forget they crucified you here? Just, it hasn't been too long ago. They just killed you. And you want us to stay here? And, and, and don't you know they're hunting down all the people your followers are saying, oh my gosh, if they've been around Jesus, we're gonna put them in jail. And they may fa face the same fate. He said, remember Jesus? Can we do it anywhere but here? Sometimes God's gonna ask you to do some things that don't make sense. Or he'll ask you to do some things that'll take you out of your comfort zone. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? He told a guy named Noah, he said, I want you to build a boat. Not just a boat, I want you to build a cruise ship. Not just a cruise ship, in the middle of the desert where it hasn't rained in 120 years and you're six miles away from water. No, 126 miles away from water. Can you imagine what Noah was going to, he was scratching his bald head just like I'm doing right now. Joshua. You need to take this city. There's 14 foot walls all the way around this city. Here's how I want you to do it. I want you to take all the people. First of all, you gotta take all these half a million people. You gotta tell them to be quiet. We can't even get anybody to be quiet during announcements in here. Come on. But he said, I want you to take these people and I want you to march around these walls seven times without saying a word. That's a miracle in itself if y'all know what I'm talking about. He said, on the, and when you get around that seven times, then I want you to shout, and you're going to see the walls come crumbling down. Joshua had to be going, God, can't we get the, can the rock launchers or whatever those are called? Catapult. catapult. <laughs> can't we get that? Can't we catapult the walls down? Can't we charge the walls? He said, no, I want you to shout the walls down. Yeah. Come on, there's some walls in your life right now that the only way you can get around them is you've got to shout the walls down. The Bible says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. He may ask you to stay where you are or he may ask you to go somewhere you don't want to go. He met the woman at the well. 
He went out of his way through Samaria to, Samaria to find her and go meet her. It says he met the demon-possessed man when he went across the sea. He went where they were. He next tells them, he says, wait for the promise of the power. Look in Luke 24, 49. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city. Stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Stay until. Well, how long is that? Stay until. But could that be a year? Stay until. Come on. We want the minute rice to cook in 30 seconds. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We got some impatient people sitting in this place right now. You want the Bob Evans potatoes because you don't want to peel a five-pound bag. For the record, Bob Evans is not that bad. Come on. We, want to, we have a hard time sitting at that red light. And yellow means go faster. I'm guilty of that one. Unless you go to Florida, then you're in trouble because you get a ticket if you go faster than yellow. But we don't have any patience. How many of us have a hard time waiting for that right person to come into their lives? We can continue to swipe right, and usually we're swiping wrong, right? Y'all know, I've never been on Tinder. And I, praise the Lord. She said, you better never be on Tinder. <laughs> but we swipe right, and most of the time it's wrong. We jump into a big purchase. We just got to have this house now, and we got to buy this vehicle now, and, and, and we have to do it. We just jump into it. Or we're waiting on it, we jump into, we're waiting on our dreams and our calling to come fruition. So we take it in our own hands. We'll try to figure it all out. We'll try to get to the place where we need to be. And by the time we get there, because God hasn't blessed it, we're struggling with our relationship. Our dreams are not coming to fruition. Our callings are being abandoned because we tried to do it on our own. God tells you, listen, so this is for somebody. God tells you to wait for a reason. The process of waiting often helps you be more patient. God, would you please give me patience? Oh, yeah, you're going to wait. <laughs> Come on, that's how God waits. He's going to say, okay, you're really going to wait? I'm going to show you. It takes away our own desires and helps us to lean more on him instead of us. It makes his desire, desires our desires. But listen, after Jesus ascended, it was still 10 days. They saw him go up into heaven, but he told them to go back to an upper room in Jerusalem and wait. Here's what happened in that period of time. The disciples' faith had much, I mean, it had grown immensely. Peter got up in that room and he said, come hell or high water, I ain't leaving this room. Come on. He started recounting all the times he had messed up. He started recounting all the things that he had done wrong. He said, I don't care if all y'all leave. I'm staying right here. God promised me something. Come on, somebody. You gotta, if God promised you, he will deliver it to you. He said, if you'll just wait on me. Peter said, I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. I'm staying. They had a word. They had a promise to stand on. And you know what happens? Patience produces power. Look at Acts 2. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord and in one place. The day had to fully come. It couldn't be a day too early. There's things that God's got you called for not a day too early. And not a day too late. It's just set up on the timetable that he has. He says it fully has to come into your life. We cannot get ahead of God. There are things in your life right now that you're already, you've already planned it out. You've already tried to figure it out. And God said, okay, just keep doing that. I'm going to make you wait just a little bit longer. Because he says you're not fully, oh, you're not fully ready for what I have for you. God was not going to pour out his spirit until they were ready to receive it. In the message, it says, you don't put new wine. Oh, some of y'all are like, man, I walked up in a Pentecostal church this morning. You did. You don't put new wine in old cracked bottles. 
You get strong, clean ones to put fresh wine in. Listen, God doesn't want it leaking out. He wants to pour it out. God is making new containers for his power. But here's the thing. It said they were in one, they were in one place. They were in one accord. Their minds were all together. They were going after the same mission. They were doing the same things. The Tower of Babel is that way. They had, a bad, they had bad motives in the Tower of Babel. But they all got their minds together. And God was like, whoa. Dang, they're all thinking the same way. I got to go down there and confuse their language a little bit. Because they're, they're liable to do, what have I created here? But what happens when you're in unity, things start clicking. When you're going in the right direction and being in the same place and going with the right crew, hanging out with the right people. Oh, come on, somebody. Hanging out with the right people and going in the right direction, that's when you find unity. God's trying to break some relationships off of you right now because they're not unified with you right now. Woo. Acts 2.2. 2. Thank you, Paige, for keeping up with me. And suddenly, come on, there's a suddenly time in your life. You've been waiting on it for so long, but there's a time when God's going to do it suddenly. Bam, like that. I just love doing bam. That's awesome. He said, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were. Acts 2, 6 says, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. Not just the people in the room heard, uh, heard the sound. The multitude around heard the sound. The, when, we were, when we start making a sound in this church, it ain't just going to be for big church. It's going to be for downtown Louisville. It's going to be for Frankfurt. It's going to be for Shelbyville. It's going to be for everyone. It ain't just the sound kept up in here. God is releasing a sound Elijah said this. He said, I don't see the rain, but I hear the rain coming. Oh, man, if that was an organ, we would really have church. He said, I don't see the rain, but I hear it coming. I don't see it yet, but I hear it coming. Come on, you, somebody's got to grab hold of that this morning. You may not see it, but it's coming. If you start tuning your ears in with the sound of heaven, oh my gosh, it's going to change the way you hear things. You may not see it, but it's coming. It doesn't look like anything we've seen. It doesn't sound like anything we've seen. It may be foreign to us, but when you get in tune with the Holy Ghost and you start doing what He asked you to do, you'll start hearing the sound a little differently. You'll say, oh, that sounds for me. That sounds for my family. That sounds for my school. That sounds for my business. That sound is for... He's going to blow in with a different sound. He is well able to equip us with whatever we need. Listen to what God had done. He'd taken a group of ordinary folks, just like us sitting in this room. He breathed the Spirit in them. He put the Spirit around them and they never would be the same. He took a bunch of cowards and He made courageous men out of them. He took a bunch of depressed people laying around and He made them possessed with a mission. Oh, if they were shy, they went from shy to shining and backwards to bold. That's what God can do in our lives this morning. Look what He did with Peter. And I'm about done. Peter... In Acts 2, 14, it says, But Peter, come on, standing up with the 11, he raised his voice. This was the same guy that ran away. It said he raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my word. The church tried to silence him. In Acts, it says, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you filled Jerusalem up with this doctrine and you intend to bring his blood on us. But Peter and all the other disciples answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God 
rather than men. Sometimes we just got to obey God rather than men. We got to do it because God said it. Listen, the culture we live in right now today, it wants you to tell you to do it your own way. I saw something on Burger King. This came to me. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost will tell you about Burger King if you ask him. On their, right out here it says, do you want to, do you want to go to a job where they rule? Come in here because you rule. I thought, what kind of a message? Oh, help me, Jesus. What kind of a message are we sending our young people right now? That you can do whatever you want to do. There are rules and there are regulations. There are things that only God can do, but you have to be obedient to His Word and do them. Burger King, you better be ruling when you ask, oh, I'm about to get in trouble in here. No more Whoppers for me. God set things in motion for a reason. He set rules in motion, not because He doesn't like you, he just don't want you, he don't want you to end up being someone you don't like. Oh, I'm going on. I could dare we go two hours on that one. But he said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And look what happens when we obey. Acts 6, 7 says, then the word of the Lord spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Listen to this. And a great many of the priests he got hold of the religious folk right there. The priests were saying, surely this is the Son of God. They were the ones that said crucify Him. They were the ones that said He was not the Son of God. The priest came around. He took 12, turned them into 120, turned them into 3,000. And in one verse it says, and 5,000 were added. Oh, what can we do if God transformed a city? You can't contain what He wants to do. All of a sudden, their city was transformed. And it says they all increased in multitude. You're getting a lot of Bible. This is Acts 4. Thank you, Paige. It says all believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes. Oh, wouldn't you love to see God do this? Both men and women. So that they brought the sick out into the streets. And they laid their beds and couches. That at least the shadow. Not you don't got to be touched all the time. The shadow of God. The Spirit of God can change everything. Peter passing that might fall on some of them, also a multitude to gather from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing the sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. They were all oh, a double L. Oh, I don't know where I'm at. Page pay, keep up with me. Listen, can I just tell you something? When he walks into the room, everything changes. When he walks into your family, everything changes. When he walks into your job, everything changes. Uh, there's, a, there's a spirit that God is releasing. We're gonna talk about the Holy Ghost next week and being who he is, because he's a who. Everything goes away. All the hopeless situations you've been going through when he walks in the room, it changes things. The dead begin to rise. If you would stand with me, please. Can I just tell you, we're called to do more than show up at church. God wants us here every Sunday. We're called to do more than just to show up at church and check it off our box. And he told us, he doesn't want us just to hang around till he comes. The Bible says occupy. O Occupy means we are doing something in the world. We're not just saying, oh, Jesus, hurry up and come on. This world's getting bad. No, we have to make a difference in the world that we're living in. And you know what? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never made that decision to follow Jesus. And listen, that's the best decision you can ever start with because right there, that sets you on a journey to knowing Him the way you need to know. I said it last week. Knowing about God is not the same thing as knowing Him. Knowing where He's going and how He's flowing and the things that He's saying. Maybe you've never joined that mission and you need to be on mission with Jesus. 
Can I just tell you, salvation is free, but it cost him everything. He offers it freely to you this morning, but it cost him his life. It cost him being beaten and torn down. And he did all of that for you. He paid the price for your sin. He paid the price for your shame. He paid the price for your guilt. All you gotta do is lay it at his feet. So there it is, Jesus. So this morning, with all heads bowed, if you would please, so no one's looking around, the Bible says this. If you believe in your heart, this is what it takes. Say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me. You say, the Bible says, confess with your mouth. You say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. Come on, that's most of us in this room. I'm a sinner and I need salvation. Will you please forgive me? The Bible says he is just to forgive us when we ask for forgiveness. You can be saved this morning. The altars will be open. We have the prayer team on the left and the right here. And this could be your morning that God can change something. This could be the morning he walks into your room, no matter what it is. You could just be here this morning and you just need a little boost from the Holy Ghost. Man, I've been kind of cruising along and I just need some extra power this morning. These altars are gonna be open for whatever you need. And let me tell you something, there's something freeing you can be freed in the back row. There's something freeing about taking a step forward and saying, God, I'm stepping out in front of all of these people and I don't want to walk out of here the same way. If you don't want to walk out of here the same way, then maybe take a step this morning. Thank you for joining us today. If you're looking for more information or resources, you can visit mybigchurch.com or follow us on social media at mybigchurch. We love you guys. See you soon. Thank you.